Um, <clears throat> so it's 11.55 a.m., uh, February 5th, 2022, and uh, I decided, because I can, I'm going to see how long I can talk about video game history, or what I know about it. <clears throat> now, of course, in five minutes, i got to go do something, but I'll stop the timer there. Um, you know, I should probably get a timer up, huh? Uh, hey, Edge, want to be useful for the first time? Uh, timer. Sure, timer, online timer. All right, Pog. Um, let's get... That's video capture. Uh, window capture. Boom. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, capture method. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and, uh, boom, boom. Okay, understood. Cool. Uh, so, this is the timer. Um, I think that's centered. Uh, anyway, this is recording at 10 frames per second, so it might not be perfectly accurate. But, uh, I figured, I'm, I'm just gonna be talking, there's not really gonna be much to watch. Uh, why sacrifice my CPU and GPU for just talking? So, anyway, um, oh shit. Stopwatch. I need a stopwatch. Dang it. S split. Okay, speed runs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll start in three minutes. Yeah. Uh, should I start in three minutes? I'm not sure. Yeah, this is essentially just probably going to be some ASMR shit. But, um, oh well. Uh, screw it. Um, where do I start? So in the early, no, not early, late 70s, there was a console called the Magnavox Odyssey. It was the very first video game console ever, and, um, well, I wouldn't say ever, but, but it, it had pretty much nothing for graphics. And uh, its commercials, since people didn't know what video games were, were always infomercials. And they were boring, much like the Xbox One commercials. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, there really wasn't much to do with the Magnavox Odyssey. I mean, it, it just it's just kind of there. It exists, and it can plug into your TV, but you need an overlay on your TV just to see, well, just to get a better quote-unquote graphics. But, um, in the, and then the, I think in the late uh, later 70s uh, or early 80s, the Atari 2600 came out, which was uh, very good with its graphics at the time. And, uh, anyone could make anything for it. So, of course, E.T. the video game had to exist. <laughs> and, uh, because of the general inconsistency between quality in those games back in those days, uh, the Atari ended up dying. And, uh, in uh, 1983, and so did the rest of the video game market. In America, that is. However, in Japan, 1983, Nintendo had made the Nintendo Famicom, or Family Computer, which was, uh, well, we know it, the, the Americans know it as the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, which came out two years later. But in Japan, the Famicom was first, and uh, Super Mario Bros. wasn't actually a launch title, because that came out in 85, and the Famicom, 83, you know, uh... However, in America, we got Mario as a launch title, and yes, mm -hmm. um, uh, and another another few games that came out. Oh yeah, Duck Hunt. Um, yeah, the game where you shoot ducks with a, with a with a with a ray gun, called the NES Zapper, which was also released in the U.S. Uh, I don't know if Japan ever got it though. Uh, I'm pretty sure you couldn't even remove the controllers on the Famicom because they were hardwired onto the system like every console prior. But, um, 1985 came in, Nintendo saved the saved video games with their Nintendo seal of quality, which 
is uh, it's basically them reviewing your game. If it's good, go ahead and put it on shelves. You can, yes, you could sell it. But if it's bad, it can go straight to hell. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but then a company, a, a small company, I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They're called Sega. And uh, they they uh, saw Nintendo's success and said, hey, I want, I want some of that. So in the 80s, they released the Sega Master System, which uh, had their uh, mascot at the time, Alex Kidd. Oh yeah, fun fact, Sonic was not always their mascot. But, um, yeah, until, until Sonic came in, Alex Kidd was the mascot. He was just a monkey. <laughs> I mean, not not like really a monkey. I mean, humanoids are humans are just evolved monkey. I'm getting off track. Anyway, he looked to me. He's always looked like a monkey, with this, with the, especially with his freaking sideburns. But um, he his games were not great. I played a few of them. They're I'm not really too fond of them. But uh. And I think Sega recognized that, along with their horrible box art at the time, which was just geometry. <laughs> it's just a graph, just a white graph, and it's got a drawing on it of uh, what the game's supposed to be, along with Times New Roman font being the, the game title and stuff. But uh, then, eventually... In 1980-something, um, an, a Nintendo employee named Gunpei Yokoi uh, got a, uh, he, took, he took a few, oh yeah, he was a janitor, by the way. <laughs> he took a few things from uh, some place in Nintendo HQ that when he was cleaning, and he made a toy called which is now called the Ultra Hand. It would extend and you could grab stuff from far away. The Nintendo executives liked it and they sold it. And Gunpei Yokoi be became... Actually, yeah, no, Gunpei Yokoi uh, was a big part of Nintendo at the time. And I think that wasn't in the early 80s. I think that was in the l very late 70s. I'm not too sure, though. However... Uh, then in 1981, I wow, this is a uh, not very linear storytelling, huh? Uh, in 1981, Gunpei Yokoi had another idea. He saw a man on a bus with, he was just playing around with his calculator, and then he got an idea. And then, what we know as the Game and Watch, was invented by Gunpei Yokoi, and it was sold internationally and in the US it was called a timeout who wants to play a timeout <laughs> um <clears throat> but then in 1989 uh, Nintendo released the Game Boy which was far less powerful than the NES and Famicom but was uh pretty good it could last a really long time on 4 AA batteries so Nintendo ended up cornering the handheld market on their first attempt, if you don't count the Game and Watch. But uh, after uh, after that, in 1991, Nintendo and Sega released. Wait, no, Sega didn't release the Genesis in 1991, right? I think that was in '89. I'm going purely off memory, but uh, I think a so, uh, late. Late 80s, early 90s, the Genesis came out. And uh, Nintendo, in 1991, released the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or the Super Famicom in Japan. And uh, there were one of the, there were a few launch titles for the Super Nintendo, uh, one of which being F-Zero, and the other one being Pilot Wings, I think? Was it Pilot Wings? I think it was Pilot Wings. But, uh, yes, F-Zero. Fun, fantastic game. It's very good. I would definitely recommend it to anyone who likes fast-paced racing games. It is 
super cool. Like the graphics, while they may not be impressive today, still hold up, actually. It's early 3D, but uh, there's not really, like, those badly aged polygons, you know? <laughs> you know, like, uh, like in Mario Party, uh, 1 and 2, and 3, I think, and uh, Mario Kart DS. Like, not even close to those. That's, like, actual pixel art, but with a mix of 3D, and I think that it just looks really good. But, um, <clears throat> and then the, the Super Nintendo had a flaw, though. You see, the Super Nintendo had a slower clock speed on its processor than the Sega Genesis. So, Sega decided to make a marketing uh, tactic where they would say that the Genesis has a little thing called blast processing. Now, blast processing wasn't real. But the Genesis was running faster than the Super Nintendo, so they capitalized on that. Even though the Genesis didn't have anything else going for it, other than Sonic and maybe Altered Beast and a few other games that I can't really... A Golden Axe? Um, I don't think Streets of Rage was... No, it wasn't. Uh, Mortal Kombat, though. Yes, Mortal Kombat was a big player for Sega. Um... So, Mortal Kombat, uh, you know, that blood-based fighting game that everyone's heard the name of at least once. Mortal Kombat! Anyways, <laughs> uh, it released on the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. However, the Super Nintendo one didn't have any blood. And you see, that's what most of the people playing Mortal Kombat wanted out of a Mortal Kombat game. So they flocked to this for the to the Sega Genesis version, which was quickly found out that there was a cheat code that let you unlock the blood in the game, so you could actually see the blood and play the game as it was intended. However, even though the blood was there, the game still looked significantly worse than the Super Nintendo, and um, <clears throat> even though. Sega was doing really well with uh, the Genesis, and the Super Nintendo wasn't doing so well, especially with uh, Nintendo kind of pushing how the Super Nintendo was a new system, and people just not really getting the point of upgrading, especially if it can't play your old NES games, which a uh, big ouch for Nintendo, honestly. They really could have done backwards compatibility, I think. It probably would have worked just as the Wii U and Wii worked together, or the 3DS and DS. I mean, it just seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> but no, no, the Super Nintendo does not do backwards compatibility, so people really didn't see the point in upgrading. So the Super Nintendo was kind of not doing so well in with publicity-wise, but the Sega Genesis was also stupidly weak, and there, wa there really wasn't much to do on it. I mean, of course, the, games, the game systems back then didn't even have a startup menu. All of, the, all of the startup logos and the Sega thing were all part of the cartridges, not the system. So you boot up the system without a cartridge, it does nothing. And, uh... <clears throat> And eventually, the Sega Genesis started to lose its started to lose its popularity a little bit because uh, in 1992, I think it is, I think it was, uh, Sega re no 1993, Sega released the Sega CD, which was just a CD-based add-on that costed three hundred dollars. Uh, you know, three hundred dollars. Uh, the 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 price you can probably find a freaking three two, two different three DS systems for nowadays. Yeah, three hundred bucks for a Sega CD, or as it was known in Europe, the Mega CD. I don't know why they. Oh, actually, no. I I think I know why because in Europe the Genesis was known as the Mega Drive. Uh, I don't know about Japan though. I don't I don't know very many regional things. I just know U.S. and Japan usually, or sometimes Europe instead of Japan. I'm not, 
I don't I don't really study that much. But um <clears throat> a Sega C D could play not good quality video and you could make really good like sounding and long games with it. And uh the prime example of this oh of the uh, of the sound and length of a game is Sonic C D. Or as it was known in development, C D Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Yikes, that could have been bad because it just it you know, it sounds like it's just Sonic One on a CD, you know, that 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 sounds pretty lame, honestly. However, um, the Sega, no, not the, uh, I, I lost track, I lost my train of thought. Um, the Sonic CD game was actually known not well, actually. It, wa it wasn't very well known. I don't know where my grammar went there. <laughs> but, um, the Sega, the, no, not the, not the Sega, um, the, the game itself was really long, and it had four different versions of every level and every song. That, that, I mean, cool. The soundtracks definitely give them a listen. They're freaking awesome. I would recommend Stardust Speedway, Bad Future, Japanese soundtrack. Oh yeah, by the way, Sonic CD had two different soundtracks. One for the Japanese and Europeans, I think, and one for the U.S. And uh, they both are pretty good, honestly, but, eh, I mean, the game itself, it's, it's just, it's not good. I don't really like the game itself. It's It seems like, okay, so the game encourages time travel, right? So you could go to the future or past and listen to the soundtracks of them at, of those stages and play through the levels but the levels themselves they're not interesting my problem with it is uh well to use time travel you have to be running at pretty much top speed for like i think five seconds and that gets pretty hard to do in sonic cd especially when the game the, the level design is so, so complex that it just doesn't work. And, uh, um, <sighs> frick, uh, what do I do? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was mostly just a bunch of labyrinths with different, like, themes and such. I mean, there's a few cool levels, I guess. I, I mean, I personally like Palm Tree Panic, uh, Stardust Speedway, and Metallic Madness. But also, yeah, the, the bosses in the game? Stupid easy. Like, it's not really challenging. Like a boss should be. Which kind of just makes the game a lot worse, in my personal opinion. And, um... Of course, there's also the good and bad endings, with just like every classic Sonic game. So, in, usually in Sonic games, there's Chaos Emeralds. In the first one, there were six Chaos Emeralds. You collect them all, and you get the good ending. You don't get Super Sonic, he wasn't invented yet. In Sonic the Hedgehog 2, there's seven Chaos Emeralds, but you get Super Sonic and the good ending. In Sonic CD... There's time stones and and robot generators. It uh, you could do either one of them to get the good ending. If Eggman has the time stones, what makes that the good ending? You can just go back in time. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't fix anything. And why is it that every time you battle Eggman, it's in the future? I mean, come on. Why? There's, like, no explanation. Why is it always in the future, regardless of it is good or... or, or bleh, regardless of if it is good or bad, why can't it just be in the past or present? I would understand if it's the past, because he's trying to take over the planet. Or the present, because of the same reason. But why the future? I mean, 
mean, there's so many little nitpicks, especially with the design of Sonic's animations, which sounds weird because of, uh, because of how I worded it. It's just Sonic animation. Uh, in every game, well, in, every, in both of the games prior to Sonic CD, Sonic would have a little jog where he would lightly bounce upward with every step until he reaches top speed, which he smoothly coasts along. That, that doesn't happen in Sonic CD. In fact, there's, there's no bouncing at all. It's just stationary running. Like, you're not, he, he, he's clearly not putting too much effort into jogging. He's just, he's just having a, he's just walking. And by walking, I mean jogging, but with, a, but with, like, it's hard to explain if you can't see it. So there's going to be some image on screen. Um. Wow, I have been talking for 18 minutes. Oh my god, okay. Um, uh, okay, the, another game uh, for the Sega CD that was pretty well known. Um, it is called... What is it called? I forgot what it is. Um, um, I, I don't remember what the title is. That's... That's that's not that's not good. Um. Anyway, let's just skip it. Let's just not talk about it. There were also a bunch of uh, Sega Genesis games that were re-released on the CDs, and it they didn't really change much. It's just the it's just the Genesis games, but on a disc. It's kind of dumb, <laughs> especially for a three hundred dollar add-on. You'd expect a lot more from it, and on top of like the. The three hundred bucks you paid for a Genesis—that's like six hundred dollars. Yeah, I can do math. <laughs> um, and then uh, the and then Sega got the bright idea to release another add-on that was pretty expensive, called the Sega Thirty Two X. Uh, the Sega Thirty Two X was not good, in my opinion. I mean, of course it added more power to the Genesis, but that thing was so bulky if you got the all the add-ons, which is just the, the CD and the 32X. That's just, it's way too big. And uh, it's just, why? Why why is the why is the Genesis that large? <laughs> um, the 32X could play Doom. I know that for a fact. The, they made a Doom port for the Sega Genesis that only ran on the 32X. You know what, speaking of Doom... Uh, that came out in 1993 for Microsoft DOS, which um, I don't know if any of you know about DOS, but it's pretty... Eh, I mean, today, it's not practical in the slightest, but back then, it was pretty good. I mean, DOS was... It was Windows... Before Windows, you know that command prompt in Windows 10 and stuff? That's just DOS. <laughs> yeah, that's what DOS is. It's just the command prompt. And uh, it could also run 8-bit programs. Or uh, also some 16-bit ones. But uh, for some of the 16-bit programs, you needed a small, a very small thing that, you know, I'm pretty sure wouldn't blow up anytime soon, called uh, Windows. You needed, uh, at the time, to play some games like Solitaire, like the official Microsoft Solitaire release, you needed Windows 3 to play it. Or uh, some other games like uh, Sierra's Outpost, or um, there weren't very many games that used Windows 3, and I'm just now realizing that. Oh. Uh, Windows 3 was mostly marketed as a business thing for businesses to use. And then Windows 95 came out. And then games stopped using DOS for the most part. But anyway, 1993, Doom came out. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal for its time, actually. And it's still pretty impressive to see how it holds up today. I mean, the 3D graphics were unheard of at the time of Doom's release. Well, not really unheard of. They were just not within the limits of 
any of any technology of that age. But Doom, th thanks to id Software, Doom Doom was a uh, really technologically impressive, and you didn't even need that much of a good computer to play it. You could play it with a with an with a two eighty six. Uh, I don't know if any of you know that, but it's stupid weak compared to the computers we have now. <laughs> you could play it with an with a two eighty six that ran DOS. You could play it with a Genesis thirty two X. You could play it with a Super Nintendo. You could play it on pretty much anything that is powerful enough. Which I guess you could say about anything. <laughs> um. Uh, and then. Well, before Doom, it had a little bit of a game called Wolfenstein 3D, and it was based on Apogee's Wolfenstein, or uh, Castle Wolfenstein, it was as, as I think it was called. It was a stealth game where you snuck past some guards and got, and just, yeah, sneak, sneak past some guards and, and escape a castle called Wolfenstein. Yeah, did I mention that the that Wolfen? Why is it called Wolfenstein? Why? I don't. I. I mean, I've never done research on why it's called Wolfenstein, but it's a game about Nazis. Why is it called Wolfenstein? I mean, I can understand Doom. And, well, I don't. I don't really understand Quake, but Wolfenstein. That just sounds like Wolf Frankenstein. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't sound impressive, I guess? However, um, Wolfenstein was its first 3D game, I'm pretty sure. And uh, even then, it was still pretty impressive. It was, it was uh, released in 90, 91 or 92. Uh, I don't know, but it did run on the Genesis without any add-ons, and that's pretty neat. And it, they also made a Super Nintendo port that uh, was heavily, heavily censored. But it's Nintendo, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, meanwhile, over in 1996, I want to say? No, 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 1995. Let's go to 1995. So, E3 of that year. Uh, there was a press conference held by Sega where they released the Sega Saturn. It was a CD-based 3D Genesis. It was just a Genesis, but could do 3D and CDs built in. Except it was also a slightly more powerful. I mean, as in, like, it could actually do real 3D instead of just magic. <laughs> um, and, uh, the retail price that they announced was, I think, $400? And they had all this information because it was a press conference. They were boring back then, and I think they still are today, depending on the press conference you go to. But it was, a, it was just a bunch of details and pricing information. $400 for a Sega Saturn. Base system, nothing comes with it. Except the controllers. You're going to need the controllers. Or, and, the, and the power supply. Anyway. And then Sony came in. Now, of course, back in the ba back before '95, Sony had tried to strike a deal up with Nintendo to make a CD-based Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and it would be revolutionary. It would be Nintendo's greatest success. And I mean, it was. It was a great success. I mean, if you've never heard of it, I'm surprised. But then there's also the fact that it never came out. Because Nintendo looked back over the contract and said, Hey, we don't like this. And then blew Sony off. So Sony then approached Sega. Uh, long story short, didn't work out. <laughs> and uh, in 1995... After Sega's presentation for the Sega Saturn, someone from Sony came up to the podium and said, 
$2.99. That's it. That's all they said. They said $2.99, walked off the stage. Now, of course, I don't know if you've heard of this. It's, it, I mean, it's, I don't, it's not a very successful brand. Screw you, I've done this multiple times already. It was PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, they announced PlayStation. And in such a way that it destroyed the Saturn's chances at even being successful. They were already destroying their competition before their console even released. Now, of course, Sega Saturn also had a bit of a surprise launch, as during E3, they said that it was out in stores at that very moment. No, it isn't. The stores weren't ready. So that's, that's just another factor to why uh, the Sega Saturn um, failed so badly. But then, well, you might ask... What happened to Nintendo? Why weren't they at the E3 press conference? Well, here's the thing. They were. They were there in E3 1995. And they released my any uh, anyone's, specifically blind people's, favorite video game console, the Virtual Boy. <laughs> It was a VR headset that could barely be called either of those two things. It w it had a stand, and you had to crouch and kind of lean forward into it. It would also only display black and red. That's not good, <laughs> especially for eyes. You know what people have? Two of well, most people have two eyes that work properly. I think it's most people. Is it most people? I don't know. But anyway, Nintendo released the Virtual Boy. Short story long, it didn't do very well. It got some launch titles in the U.S. and then was barely even supported afterwards. And it was Nintendo's worst failure ever. However, in 1995, Windows 95 came out. Who could have guessed that in 1995, Windows 95 would come out? Anyway, enough of that. Enough, enough of being dumb. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in 1996, Nintendo came back with their very next high-end, premium, amazing console that could that could do 3D graphics unlike anything heard of before. The Nintendo 64. And it used cartridges when everyone else had moved on to CDs. Nintendo! You could put more data on a CD. You could... You, CDs were cheaper to make. Nintendo! Dude! Are you, like, high all the time? <laughs> what happened to your executives? Are they always high? Uh, anyway, then Nintendo 64 came out in 1996. Launch title of uh, Pilot Wing 64, I think. No, Wave Race 64. And Super Mario 64. Only one of those being one of the most recognizable games of all time. And speaking of that most recognizable game, uh, Wave Race was actually... Um, was an arcade game, kind of like Hydra Thunder, and you know those car racing games that you're gonna find at like a Game Works or something, uh, or at an or at an arcade in a casino. Yeah, uh, it was just kind of those, but water, and also not cars. It was jet skis. So yes, it was Hydra Thunder. Anyway, um, <clears throat> now let's talk about the other the other game. Super Mario 64, uh, that one, I mean, it didn't do all that well, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a failure. Uh, Mario 64 was, um, quote-unquote, revolutionary by, uh, other people. Now, of course, I'm joking when I say quote-unquote, I mean, it was, I mean, I cut me some slack, I'm trying to, 
I'm really trying. But honestly, I love Mario 64. It's uh, one of my favorite games. I always, well, once in a while I play it. I uh, grew up with the Super Mario 64 DS. And uh, it, it's, it's still, it, it remains one of my favorite games of all time. It, it's just good. It's a good game. It's very poggers. Uh, <clears throat> but the Nintendo 64 was, um, well, you know, it used cartridges, so there wasn't much you could do on it. Of course, not, uh, of course, compared to CDs. Now, of course, there's a company called Square Enix. You know, I mean, you probably not know. Uh, screw that bit, honestly. They make Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, Balan Wonderworld. <laughs> um... Mm. Uh, I, what do I do? <laughs> My brain stopped. Oh yeah, Square Enix. Um, yes, in the '80s and early '90s, they made Final Fantasy games for Nintendo Entertainment System and Super Nintendo Entertainment System and Game Boy. But um, in 1995, when the PlayStation came out, um, well. Nintendo kind of got abandoned <laughs> by Square Enix. I mean, of course, with the very weak, very, very weak hardware of the Nintendo 64, how could anyone make an RPG of on just 40 megabytes? That's Yes, that's the limit that Nintendo 64 cartridges had, 40 megabytes. Now, of course, now that sounds like, oh my god, I could store a, I could store, like, three million QR codes in there. I, I, well, well over three million, actually. I think it's closer to 40 million. Uh, oh, I don't think I know it's closer to 40 million. I just don't know what exact number it is. You could fit a ton of QR codes in 40 megabytes. So, just the, just, 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 just the fact that... Nintendo made a 40 megabyte cartridge. How is that enough for Zelda? I don't know, because Zelda is a pretty big game, and yet they managed to cram Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask into 40 megabyte cartridges. Honestly, that's just impressive. I mean, I don't care what you say, that's just impressive. That's Honestly. Anyway, let's let's go back to id Software. Nineteen ninety six. They had a they had another game coming out. Uh, you may you you may know it. It was called Quake. Uh, it was revolutionary for its time, just like the previous two games before it. And uh, it was it. Honestly, I've I've beaten the game. Not bad. Honestly, I mean. I've sp I've spent more time than I would like to playing Quake. I've beaten it twice. Meanwhile, I've beaten Zoom, Doom, Zoom, Zoom. What is this? Twenty twenty. Uh, meanwhile, I've beaten Zoom. God damn it. <laughs> meanwhile, I have beaten Doom. Zero times. I've I've never beaten the original Doom. I've never beaten Doom two. Never beaten Doom three. But I have beaten Doom twenty sixteen and Doom Eternal. I swear. I've beaten those. Uh, it's it's okay, I guess. Doom Eternal. It, uh... uh <sighs> I once spent four hours on a single level of Doom Eternal. So, I'm... I'm not much of a fan of the amount of exploration you have to do. I don't like exploration in games. I... So, of course, I play Minecraft, so that's kind of a thing I have to do if I want to even progress through the game. But usually when I play Minecraft or any exploration game, I just find a place to settle and uh, never leave. <laughs> Why be a nomad when you could stay in one place? I don't know where I was going with that. Um, so, of course, Quake being very monumental success that it was, got a Nintendo 64 port, somehow, and somehow, on the 64, it looks better than it does on the computers, 
that you know just thinking about that it doesn't doesn't sound it doesn't sound correct i mean the n64 had colored lighting and uh it just generally looked much better but how does it look better on a Nintendo 64? Genuinely. Anyway, um, uh, any, enough about the third generation, I think it is. No, fourth gen of consoles. Let's move on to 1998. So, of course, Microsoft was releasing Windows 98 at the time, which was so huge, just like 95. 98 was... Uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. It was an, an improvement over 95, in my opinion, but it wasn't good, in my it also in my opinion. And uh, Sega had decided to release another console. Now, I've done a video with this specific console before. It is called... Oh, frick, I just kicked my desk. Um, <laughs> it is called... The Sega Dreamcast, and it was revolutionary for its time. How many times am I going to say that? And uh, its launch title was Sonic Adventure. Now, as a lot of you don't know, as a lot of you know, I don't like Sonic Adventure. It's very buggy. It's just genuinely not fun. And it's kind of hard to know what's next. I mean, I had to I had to look up a guide in the video that I made for Sonic Adventure. I had to look up a guide for a game from 1998 because I because it didn't tell me where to go. <laughs> Sometimes. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a bit I'm a little bit tired. Um. So, of course, Sonic Adventure came out. No one likes Big the Cat. Because of fishing. Because cats fish. Cat fish. That. <laughs> good job, Nathan. Good, 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 good work. Good, good work. You've successfully done something. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but I did something. <clears throat> anyway, the PlayStation 2 was about to come out. In, well, about to. I think that was in. About to was in 2000. Not. Not 98. Uh, it was either 98, 99, or 2000. I know it definitely wasn't 2001. However, in 1998, Nintendo had something new up their sleeve. Something that would push the absolute limits of the hardware at the time the Game Boy Color. Because they finally started caring about the Game Boy after n nearly an entire decade, they 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 th they thought, hey, this is this is good for a whole decade. Nintendo. I know the Game Boy was was a success, but a whole decade. You can't expect a console to live that long, especially when it's being triumphed by the freaking Nintendo sixty four. Uh, anyway, 1998, the Game Boy Color just came out. It, it could, it had, the it had a, oh, brain, work! Okay. The GBC, or Game Boy Color, had a processor that was twice as fast as the original Game Boy. It was completely backwards compatible with the Game Boy, and even had some color presets built in for some Game Boy games, like Super Mario Land, and Donkey Kong. Now, of course, the GBA, well, not the GBA, the GB, the GB, the the, 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 the GBC, the Game Boy Color. Yes, it can do colors, as as as. <sighs> My brain. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <sighs> uh, why does my brain not work? Um, the Game Boy Color has some exclusive games like Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening DX, which, to be honest, Link's Awakening DX was a remake of Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. Link's Awakening DX was a Game Boy game. 
well, it was a Game Boy Color game, but originally a Game Boy game. The Game Boy Color's biggest success is a Game Boy game instead of a Game Boy Color. You know, that that that, that just doesn't that doesn't feel right. <laughs> um and of course there were some other games that made use of the Game Boy Color's hardware, uh, such as I don't remember what they are. <laughs> but for but up until that point, Nintendo was Nintendo was just Nintendo had the handheld market, honestly. And we didn't even cover the other handheld, like the Atari Lynx or the Sega Nomad. Or even the Sega Game Gear. Both of those systems suck. <laughs> just from my opinion. Genuine opinion. They suck. It's not that they're not powerful or anything. Well, for their time, it's just... I mean, there's multiple factors to it. I mean, there's... I mean, yes, of course, they're a lot more powerful in the Game Boy. But the batteries? Yeesh. Yikes. That's uh, not a very good battery life, huh? Anyway, regardless of those awful held spawns of things, <laughs> Nintendo was doing pretty good, except for uh, when PlayStation utterly destroyed them in uh, the fourth generation of consoles. Uh, good work, Nintendo. <laughs> good work. <sighs> oh my god. Why am I so tired? I've just been talking constantly for 45 minutes. <laughs> um. Uh, then in 2000. Uh, yes, 2001. Nintendo made a good decision for the first time ever. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They made good decisions before, like that one time that they, uh, that they, that they hosted Love Hotels, which is just a place where people go to... Never mind, I'm not going to finish that sentence. Anyway, Nintendo released the GameCube and the Game Boy Advance. Now, the GBA, as m more commonly known, it was pretty big, to be honest. And, uh, it was really powerful. I mean, it was nearly as powerful as a Super Nintendo from ten years prior. <laughs> and, well, it was, it was not even close to as powerful, but the graphics capabilities of it were nearly on par. The other stuff, uh, wasn't really... Anyway, um, my brain, if only it could work. I wish that my brain worked. Um, the GameCube had, uh, such names as, uh, F-Zero GX, uh, another fantastic fast-paced racing game for any of you interested. And, uh, of course, it had Super Mario Sunshine. I hate that game. I am never making a video on it. Well, don't, don't, I'm not going to keep, I'm probably not going to keep my word on that. <laughs> uh, just, just take that with a grain of salt. I hate the game, though. It is so bad. I mean, okay, off topic, but Sunshine is so bad that I've owned Mario 3D All-Stars for nearly two years at this point. And, well, not even nearly two years, it's just a year and a half at this point. I've 100%ed Mario 64, I have 100%ed Mario Galaxy, I haven't even gotten 5% through Sunshine. I hate that game so much, and sometimes I will play it, and... God! N God, why? Why does it have to exist? Um... Mm. Anyways... I hate sunshine. Um, also that in general, but not just the game, I hate being in the sun. Uh, it also had such names as Super Smash Bros. Melee, known as the best Super Smash Bros. game up until Smash Ultimate for some some reason. I mean, to be honest, I, per I personally really, 
freaking loved Brawl. It was so good, in my opinion. And of course, this is an opinion. Don't say I'm wrong. In, in the comments, if you're still watching, it's been 48 minutes. <laughs> what are you doing with your life? Mm. Anyways, uh, Smash Bros. Oh, yeah, and also, uh, S Sega decided to uh, quit making games. Well, not games, but game consoles. And uh, that that business kind of... Yeah, they, they just decided to uh, put some of their games on the GameCube and the upcoming big sensation, the Microsoft Xbox. You know what? Let's take a brief trick trick trip back to late 1999 now of course this is before the xbox this is before the gamecube and Game Boy advance microsoft was uh, that, that what not great during this time period this specific time period because Late 1999 is when they released Windows Millennium Edition. It is known as the worst version of Windows ever. Even being worse than Windows 1.0, which literally could not do anything. Windows Millennium was so bad that just to optimize it and make it slightly faster than Windows 98 because of all the new fluff they added in Millennium, they removed one of the greatest features for any DOS gamers in the 90s. They removed MS-DOS. Well, they didn't remove MS-DOS. I mean, Windows 9X, 95, 98, 98, Special ed Second Edition, and Millennium were built on DOS, but um, they removed the ability to boot the system into DOS mode, which is how some people got to play Doom on their Windows computers, if they didn't get Doom for Windows 95. <laughs> um, but then, uh, Microsoft decided to redeem themselves in 2001 by not only releasing the Xbox, which, I mean, honestly, kind of good. I mean, I haven't really played many X uh, original Xbox games, but the graphics are pretty good. And, uh, well, not only did they release the Xbox in, tw in 2001, they also released Windows XP. Windows XP is the first commercial-based Windows NT system. NT being the, the new kernel that they use. Basically, Windows 10. You, you know how it... Yes, Windows 10, that's built on the NTOS kernel. But uh, Windows XP is also built on that kernel. Just a, a, a very much earlier version. Windows XP is turning 22. No... 21 years old. Oh my god, Windows XP is going to be old enough to drink. <laughs> what are my thoughts? Um, uh, anyway, Windows XP was monumental for Microsoft, of course. This is getting boring. <laughs> Even for me. Let's talk about memory cards. Let's take a, let's take, yeah, I mean, we're already at pretty much the end of our lives. So. 1990. Five. Uh, the PlayStation came out, and it didn't have any internal storage, and, well, unlike the cartridges before, you can't stick a freaking battery on a CD. I mean, you can, but is it going to be readable? No. <laughs> is it probably going to ruin the disc? Yeah. Don't put a battery on your disc. <laughs> yeah, the way that games used to be saved, and... Like NES, Super Nintendo, Genesis, literally anything before the PlayStation, was 
uh, there was a battery, a small battery in the cartridges that would say that would store your save data and uh, this battery could die out at any moment any moment that it wanted and that was uh, a lot a lot more prevalent with pokemon games because some of them i think maybe all of them actually they used an internal clock and for that to work it has to have power so it's drawing power from that battery or another battery but eventually the clock would stop working and then you would really not be able to play Pokemon anymore <laughs> however 1995 uh, the PlayStation came out and they had a thing called memory cards because you can't put a battery on a disc now of course Nintendo and Sega were still using cartridges i mean there was a cartridge port on the sega saturn but i don't know what that was used for but the nintendo 64 that was just cartridges there were there were batteries in there it was i mean cheap i guess it was a lot more money to manufacture but eh, whatever it's nintendo but uh then in uh, 1998 of course, with the memory cards success, Sega decided to innovate on the memory cards. Now, of course, I've already brought up the Dreamcast, but I never brought up the controller. And it had a little thing on it. It was, it was a little hole where you could put what was called a VMU, a visual memory unit, or virtual memory unit, I don't know. But it was called a VMU, and it could save data. But what Sega's VMUs could do is that if there was enough space on the VMU, you could use a Dreamcast game to put a very small, minuscule game on your VMU. Now, of course, there were some games like Sonic Adventure and I think so. I think it was just Sonic Adventure, but Sonic Adventure Two, that uh, put your little Chow, which are kind of like pet simulation things, like Nintendogs or any other pet simulator that I can't think of right now. But it was basically it was just basically their version of that, and Chows are all also very very cute, honestly. Anyways, um, you could put a Chow on your VMU and take it out with you when you go with when you go on walks. Because of how small the VMU was, it could it could, it could fit. I mean, I think it's 1.5 times the size of a Nintendo DS cartridge. That sounds right. Yeah. But the VMUs, like they had, they had screens. They had very pixelated screens, black and white only, to save on power. And they had batteries because yes, this is. This is the 90s. Batteries are everything. Actually, even now, batteries are everything. They're just rechargeable now. And, uh... Another thing that Sega did with their games on, on the VMU was display some little information on the VMU that only really you would be able to see because who's going to look at your controller? <laughs> and, uh... Some games, like Sonic Adventure, just displayed characters on there. Just little character art. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, and uh, some... I don't know what other games did. I've only ever played Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast. <laughs> I've never played anything else that, well, isn't Crazy Taxi. I've played Crazy Taxi a couple times. And uh, anyway... Back to the 2000s. So Nintendo had just released the GameCube. It uses CDs. Good for them. However, of course, you can't put a battery on a CD. So what do they do? Memory cards. They put memory cards on their GameCube, and you can you can save your data to the memory card. Now, of course, this made it a bit more clunky to bring your saves around with you, because like before. With the cartridges, all you needed was the cartridge. And the system, if your friend didn't have it, all you needed was the cartridge. And you could play your save file on it. 
but now you need a CD, its case so that the disc doesn't get scratched, and a memory card. So of course that's a little bit more clunky, you know? It's a bit more space consuming. Less efficient, as I would rather say. But the memory cards could store a lot more data on them than a battery could. So you could have like multiple game saves on one card and well that's that's pretty neat and all, but what about the Xbox? What does it have? It has an internal hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> it has an internal hard drive, which makes memory cards pretty much useless unless you want to bring your save over to someone else for some reason. I mean, if if that's all you're buying memory cards for, just buy a small memory card. I mean, you don't need a very big one. You just keep the games on your hard disk. I mean, it's saved internally, and there's a ton of space in it. I think there's, I think there might be like a couple gigabytes for the original Xbox, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but back then it was. I mean, heck, even having an eight gigabyte hard drive was impressive. Now we've got like one terabyte and two terabyte hard drives. I mean, that's just, it's a bit overkill, honestly. In my opinion, it's overkill. But uh, yeah, the original Xbox. Internal hard drives, which ended up becoming the standard in uh, 2006. Of course, the Xbox wasn't very big. I mean, it's a new console from people that make Windows. People would think it's a computer because that's essentially what it is. <laughs> but, um, 2005 and six. The Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and the the the, the my what in my, what in my opinion is the greatest success of all time, the Nintendo Wii. Now, hear me out. I know the PlayStation 2 sold way more, and it is the highest selling, but that doesn't mean it's the most successful. Not to me. Not to me. It doesn't mean that. Success is in terms of gaming, is how not just how many units your console sells. If it was just that, yes, of course, the PS2 is the greatest selling console of all time. But the Wii was innovative. You see, with the PlayStation 2, they just used the same controller from the PS1. And, I mean, it's just the same internals as well. Well, not the same, not exactly the same. There's some improvements, but you see, the PlayStation Two. All right, well, think of it this way. Nostalgia. You play a game as a kid, like a PlayStation game, like Gran Turismo, or uh, Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid is a good example, and Gran Turismo, and uh, Rainbow Six, and Rayman. All of those fantastic examples. But you know the problem there? They're all different. They're all very different. Now, of course, Rayman, 2D platformer, Rainbow Six, shooter. Um, what, did I, what else did I say? Gran Turismo, Racer, Metal Gear Solid, Stealth. They're all different. But with Nintendo, I mean, with every Nintendo console, actually, you could put some people in a room. You could put, like, a group of different people, completely different people, hell, even raised in different countries, in, different, in the same room. They've all probably played similar games to each other. But the PlayStation, it's... Well, it's not that. That's why Nintendo's nostalgia factor is so good. Because some, everyone's played Super Mario Bros. Well, everyone, I know. But, um, Super Mario Bros. was big. And, yes, I am getting really tired. Um, I'm not even 
Oh my god, I'm not even close to the end, I don't think. But, uh, of course, Nintendo's nostalgia factor thingy, it, it's a lot more relatable with other Nintendo gamers. I mean, now nowadays, you, you, there's a high chance you've played Smash Bros. or Mario or Zelda at least once. But when was the last time you played Gran Turismo or Metal Gear Solid? Hell, even Rayman. I mean, there's a lot of different genres on PlayStation, and while that can be a good thing to rope in more customers, it's it's not good down the line. Now, another reason why Nintendo, well, why the Wii was a big success, in my opinion, more so than the PlayStation 2, is because of Virtual Console. The Wii, uh, on the Wii Shop channel, you could download old Nintendo, Sega, Turbo Graphics, 16, uh, Commodore, Amiga, and Commodore 64, I think, uh, games, pretty much from any console before it, and even that, and even the Wii had backwards compatibility with the GameCube. You could play nearly everything you could on your GameCube on the Wii. Which, eh, oh. Uh, Thanks, Windows, for telling me how to for telling me how to back up my computer, which I don't want to do. But um, uh, the Wii had backwards compatibility with the GameCube, and that alone adds a lot of options. But with the Wii also being powerful enough to run Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, I mean, yes, the PlayStation 2 was better. Well, it sold more. Oh, I wouldn't say better. <clears throat> but the Wii is really the only Nintendo console you need if you want to get into classic gaming. Heck, the Wii might even be the only console you, you ever need from any company. Unless you want to play a PlayStation or Xbox game and buy those consoles. But, uh, the Wii was pretty good. It didn't really sell as much as the PlayStation 2, but it was still innovative, successful, and you, you could play pretty much everything on it. Not to mention the software library was immense. But um, you might have noticed that we skipped over 2004. But of course, 2004... PlayStation Vita, no, the PlayStation Portable, and the Nintendo DS. Uh, the DS was announced, and it came out. Of course, the DS had its faults when it first came out, but then they released the DS Lite in 2006, I think it is, and it fixed most of those flaws. And then they released the DSi in late, tw late 2000s, and it was great. It had a DS shop channel, but, what, well, uh, computer, what, what got disconnected, hello? Okay, um, uh, I was, I got distracted, um, the DS was a big success, it was probably the highest selling con portable console ever, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really want anyone to quote me on that, I don't know if I'm right. But, I mean, I've seen a lot more people with DSs than PlayStation Portables or Game Boys or, heck, even Nintendo Switches. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so Nintendo, in my opinion, they may not have the most powerful consoles. They may not have the best, the, the top-end quality gaming, well, top-end power-wise, like the Xbox One, PS3, and PS4, and the Xbox 360, they're all a lot more powerful. But Nintendo doesn't need powerful consoles. They just need something that they can put good games on. They just want something to put fun games on. And of course, they also want money. And you know, weaker consoles are easier to make and cheaper to make too. Um, 
But of course, you don't really need to have a powerful console to have fun. I mean, you could still find an original NES and have a blast playing Galaga, Pac-Man, Mario, Duck Hunt, Zelda, Kirby. You don't need power to have fun. And Nintendo has capitalized on that. Of course, I've also capitalized on the casuals, but we don't talk about them. <laughs> that took a turn. Um, anyway, uh, back to the consoles and stuff, the PS3. Sony thought that if they made the PS3 unique and it wouldn't have the same internals as every other console at the time, it would be... Um, it would make it so that the developers of PS3 games would spend more time working on the PS3 instead of the other consoles so that they'd always get the releases first. On top of that, the PS3 was expensive. I see, uh... Well, I could probably tell what happened. The PS3, while it's nearly as powerful as the PlayStation 4, honestly, it's quite impressive. I mean, even though they've really messed up with the hardware, I mean, developers would usually just make games for other systems and then work on PS3. That was uh, not very good for Sony. Oh yeah, I even remember one of the adver one of the people in Sony's advertising campaigns for PS3. Uh, they were fired because they appeared in a commercial for Mario Kart Wii. <laughs> um, or maybe it wasn't Mario Kart. It was just I know it was for the Wii though. Uh, meanwhile, Xbox was gaining traction, and we got Call of Duty. <laughs> you know. The game with a bunch of four-year-olds talking crap to all the adults. Uh, I don't like the. I don't like Call of Duty. Honestly, I've. I've. I used to be. I used to be addicted to Call of Duty, but now that I look back on it, it's just not. It's not my type of game. Anyway, uh, coming. Um.
where was I? Right, the development would, um, uh, uh, they would put it on other consoles before PS3. And the PS3 had very powerful hardware, but no one ever knew how to make it work, so no one really developed much for it. Uh, and PS3 was kind of a failure, to be honest. Um, um, I am blanking. Um, I don't want to record anymore. Thank you all for watching.